Good morning. Okay. Now I'm supposed to talk to you today about my pain. Well, at least I think I'm supposed to talk to you about my pain. So we shall start off with me. I'm Aaron Lim. I had my first sleep disc when I was 15 years old. I have back pain almost every day, but I've not had surgery. And so I'm here to tell you why you shouldn't have surgery if possible for problems with your back. So let's start. First slide. Okay. Uh, I work in Island Hospital. Uh, I run the rehab department, and part of the reason I run the rehab department, as we go towards the end of the slides, you'll understand that rehab actually is very, very important for your back. And that's how, in the long run, you're going to avoid back pain. Now, the part we are concerned about is this area here. This is the lower back, where most of people will actually have problems. And unfortunately, it's going to be 100%. This is one time where you can almost guarantee somebody will have back pain at least once in their life. And unfortunately, as you get older, it may actually get worse. But still, it's possible to avoid back pain. The part concerns here is the lower lumbar spine. There's five lumbar spine. All together in your back, from the top of your neck to the bottom of your back, there's 23 bones. In between each bone, is actually what's called a disc. So your back is made up of stacks of bones with a disc in between. At the back, they connect together to what's called facet joints. And so these are the structures that actually give you problems in the long run. Now, you must remember the back actually is like a first class lever. So everything is in front. You have muscles behind which hold the back. And then everything's just pulling. So obviously, the bigger you are, unfortunately, the more the weight and the back will have to carry. So once you put on weight in front, everything, the lever arm in front becomes longer and longer, and your back has to work harder and harder to keep everything in place. So that's why posture, and that's why weight in front is very very important and not to increase. So the most common part of back causes of back pain usually is muscular. So that's the lucky part. So you go and play football, you fall down, uh, you play basketball or whatever, you slip on the floor. Most of the time you get up, a bit of pain behind, then you're fine the next day. So that one you can ignore. The one that we really want to talk about is this injury. Uh, like I said to you, when I was 15 years old, I had my first slip disc. Uh, I didn't know until I did medical school that I had slip disc. So all I knew was I had this back pain uh, with pain going down the leg. And I remember sitting down and saying, oh, this pain is terrible. And it took a while for it to sort out. So when I then went to medical school and then found out, oh, that's what I have. I had a slip disc when I was 16 years old. So it can happen at any time. It can happen when you're 16. It can happen when you're 30. It can happen when you're 45. It doesn't matter. But unfortunately, as you get older, the disc becomes what's called degenerate and the chances of it pressing on the nerve to the, to the leg becomes much higher. So, so most common cause of back pain or a slip disc is usually aging. And now everybody says, oh, not all, not all, not all. So you have to think of the back like a pile of bricks. 
Remember I showed you the diagram just now? There's spikes of bone in between, and in between is a disc. So you have one brick, one brick, and then you have the disc in between, and that's your cement. So as you age, this cement becomes less and less supple, and then your disc will sink, and then your bones will sink. And so by the time you reach 60, 70 years old, you'll find that you're a bit shorter, which is very true, because as the disc sink, you lose one millimeter per disc. And remember I said to you, you have 23 discs, and so you will lose at least 2.3 cm as you get older. Then as it decreases in height, it then starts pressing on the nerve. And remember I told you the facet joints at the back will then start to ache. So this is what happens. So this is normal. This is the bones. This is the disc in between. So these are your stack of bones, uh, stack of bricks. This is your, your disc. And then as you age, the disc becomes thinner. The bones become closer, so you lose one millimeter per stack per, per disc. And then as this drops down, the hole where the nerve comes up from here and here becomes narrower, so it starts pressing on the nerve, and then you get pain. And then on top of that, the joints behind then starts to abut against each other, and you get more pain. So this is responsible for the back pain and also for this nerve pain, which then goes down the leg. So these are the types of degenerate discs that we have. So whether it's uh, a bulging disc, or whether it's a herniated disc, which means that the disc actually goes behind and presses on the nerve. This is the degenerate disc, which is the most common. And then as it thins out in the long run, you get thinning of the disc and you lose the height of the disc. And that's where you'll, you lose the one millimeter. So when you have a slip disc, you get back pain. And what really brings people to the doctor is then you get this pain going right down the leg. Usually it goes behind the leg, behind the calf, and then it goes into the foot. Uh, in the older patients, sometimes they don't have so much of this leg pain, but they get cramps at night. And the cramps can be quite severe. You wake up in the middle of the night, you get cramps in your leg. And that's not a good sign. That also tells you basically that the disc is not, not doing very well. And there's pressure on the nerve. So, uh, this is the best part, you see. How many people think that aging only starts at 60 years old? Well, the answer is actually aging starts at 30. Very unfortunate, isn't it? Now, why do I say aging starts at 30? So, we will do the what's called the mirror test. Mirror test is very easy. You take a photograph when you're 18 years old, then you put it facing out so you don't see the photograph. And then you look in the mirror. If you look in the mirror, you look the same. Okay, you're not aged. But if you look in the mirror, you don't look the same. Which almost inevitably, inevitably you will not look the same. You're definitely not the same age as 18. <laughs> so next one, next one, next one. Sleep on the floor. So at 30 years old, if you're 30, you go and sleep on the floor today. And tomorrow morning, you wake up, you tell me whether you feel the same when you were 18 years old. So... Obviously not, isn't it? So that's the sleep on the floor and mirror test. Now, we go to more, uh, let's say, professional tests, okay? Women's bone mass, okay? I'm sure the women will be very interested in this. You see, if you track women's bone mass along the ages, they increase until they are about 30, 35 plus, and then it stays stagnant. Then unfortunately, after when you have your menopause, it starts to drop. But it, it peaks at about 30 plus. It never gets more than that after 30 plus. So, unfortunately, at 30 plus is when maximum bone mass is obtained. And that's when we know that women are at the inverted common speed, 30 plus, okay, in terms of bone mass. It's the same with professional athletes. If you look at professional athletes, why can't they play until 50, 60? Because they're getting old. Their recovery is less fast they start to ache more, their mobility also is not as good. So if you look at all the professional athletes, usually by about 30, 35, okay, some stretch it to about 37, 38, even early, uh, late 30s, you can see that they are slower, they're not as quick on the, on the football field, they're not as quick on the tennis court. But they can still continue playing, it's not that they cannot continue, but they cannot play at the same level. You take videos of them when they were 20 plus and videos of them when they're 30 plus, you can see that the movement is very different. And that's why, unfortunately, we start to age when you're about 30 plus. So when people say that uh, professional players 
Uh, if they pick, actually that's not good news. Because once they pick, it's downhill afterwards. No good. The most accurate investigation you can have is what's called an MRI. So on the MRI, what you will see, this is a normal MRI. You can see that the stacks of bone I've shown you are here. These are the stacks of bone. This is the disc in between. Normally, at the back, if you trace a line at the back, it's all flat. It's all nice and all together. Now, if you take a 55-year-old lady whose MRI is like this, you can see the disc here is flattened. See, it's nice and bulging. I mean, it's nice and uh, thick here. Over here, it's actually all thinned up already. And it's thinned up in almost every level. It's starting to bulge at the back here. And there's actually a big prolapse this here, which is degenerate as well. And it's pressing on the nerve to the leg. And that's why she came to see me with pain down the right leg, and which is because of this uh, pressure around the nerve. And this is a very good example of a degenerate disc, which has thinned up completely. So she would have lost probably 2 mm in this disc and probably about 1 mm in this disc. So it all accumulates. So it doesn't... It, 2 mm, 1 mm doesn't sound a lot, but I mean, 23 this all degenerate, you get you, you can lose height by about 2 to 3 cm uh, as you age. So what to do next? Uh, if you have pain down the leg, it does not, and I repeat this, it does not mean you need surgery. 90% of the time, you do not need surgery in the back. I can all be treated non-surgically first, and if you still have pain and you still have problems, then consider surgery. There are several modes of treatment. One is physiotherapy and then medication, we'll go through this. Exercise, which is the most important. And there's a new, there are injections now you can do for the back, which then calm the nerve down, you have less pain in the leg, and you don't actually have to do anything. Right, so 90%, as I said, of patients do not, and I repeat this, do not need surgery, okay? So what does physiotherapy do? Physiotherapy basically, what, what the physiotherapist will try and achieve is to do muscle releases in the back and also do some manipulation in the back so that the pain comes down, the pressure on the nerve comes down, the muscle spasm comes down, and therefore you feel better. So I've also been asked about chiropractors, osteopaths, and Chinese insects. I will use all of them. Chiro there's nothing wrong with the chiropractor, there's nothing wrong with the osteopath, and there's nothing wrong with the, with the Chinese insect, as long as they know what they're doing. Uh, there are a few good chiropractors in Penang, there are a few good osteopaths in Penang, there are a few good Chinese insects in Penang. I'm not allowed to say who on this video, but obviously you, want to, you, can, you can call or you can come and see me and I will tell you. Because some of them are very good. It doesn't mean that every single chiropractor is a quack, every single osteopath is a quack, and also it doesn't mean that every Chinese insect is a quack. There are good Chinese insects around who really do know what they're doing. Medication temporarily, if you have a lot of pain, you take some painkillers, you take some what's called anti-inflammatories, and there's a special nerve inhibitor tablet you can take now which cuts down the impulses in the nerve, and that makes you feel better. Now, it's actually important to take some medication while you're doing physio because sometimes if you have so much pain, it's actually very difficult for the physiotherapist or the chiropractor to work. Because if you're in a lot of pain, he cannot move your back or she cannot move your back, and the moment they move your back, you get more pain. So sometimes it's easier to get the pain down first, and then only you start doing some physiotherapy or your chiropractic treatment. So, if your back still hurts, you say, oh, I don't want to surgery, I don't want surgery, is there another alternative? The answer is yes, you still can do something else. Unfortunately, it's not a big needle here, it's okay. So, what we do is what's called uh, radio frequency. Now, first, the traditional method has been always to inject steroids around the back. Uh, steroids are actually, if you use them properly, they're actually very good. But it's just that, unfortunately, sometimes they're used too often. And so the pain, uh, so people have a bad impression of steroids. This is also very different from taking steroids by mouth because steroids by mouth, if you take steroids, it affects the whole body. So when you're giving steroids into the back only, it only lacks locally. But the disadvantage of steroids is that if you do one injection, you cannot do it again because it's not good for the joint. So you just do it once. So we've started moving away uh, from steroids and there's this uh, modality called pulse radio frequency stimulation where you actually same thing, you put a needle next to the nerve in the back and you pass a radio frequency current. And what happens then is that the nerve calms down, it becomes less sensitive, and therefore you get less pain in the leg. 
your muscles also then be, don't become so spasmodic and you have less pain. And so that avoids medication, that avoids uh, steroids, and you actually feel better after that. Now, it's been used in Europe for actually a long time. Uh, it's just that in Malaysia, I think it's been here for about, maybe about 10 years. But in Europe, they've used it, in, it was invented by the Germans and the Dutch in the, uh, in the late, late 80s, early 90s. And they've been using it for years. And so why it hasn't come here is very simple. Uh, because the publications and the techniques in Europe are all published either in German or French. So it was not until it became available in the English literature in the early 2000s that it then started to spread around the so-called English-speaking world and other, other countries then adopted it. And that's how we learned about it when we, we, uh, when we came over to, to, to Malaysia. So it's an injection. Uh, there's no steroids. We only use local anesthetic. And it consists of an injection around the back. And this is an x-ray of one of the patients I've had. Uh, who has uh, injection what, the radio frequency and this is the needle going inside the back it's done under local anesthetic uh, basically it's minimal pain you put the uh, local anesthetic in the skin you then put the needle down inside the next to the nerve and by passing the radio frequency current the pain comes down and so you feel some tingling in the nerve this is the machine that we use there's so many there are different types you feel some tingling in the nerve while we're doing it but otherwise they go back the same day so it's, it's safe because it's done uh, under local anesthetic. It is not surgery. Uh, it's the same as like taking blood or giving blood or giving painkiller injections. And you can walk after. So basically, you come in the morning, uh, you get your injections done, and then if you have insurance, you stay on as daycare, and then you can go home after that. Uh, and usually, the insurance will pay for this. So there are very few, they have not come across any insurance which have not agreed to, to, to cover this procedure as a daycare. So it's very easy. Now, immediately after the injection, you actually feel, should feel better already. Uh, that's part of, partly because of the injection, partly because the local anesthetic is working. And you, the response rate is about 80%. Generally, the target we are trying to achieve is 50% less pain uh, within the first week. And then over the next 100 days or 3 months, you should get about 60, 70, 80%. And by doing physio or chiropractic treatment, uh, the, the pain should come down even, even more. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So obviously, if you get better with this, you don't, you then don't need surgery. Ah, this is very important. Once you have the pain down, you have to try and maintain the back. Ah, this is where exercise becomes very important. And exercise is not just exercise because if you just say exercise, people end up doing all sorts of things and say, "Oh, I'm exercising." Like if you if you go cycling, cycling doesn't exercise the back. Because remember, when you cycle, you're all hunched down over the handlebars, your back doesn't move. You go running, also doesn't exercise your back. And if anything, actually, that might actually jar your back even more. Because when you go running, you pound on the ground, your back is straight as you run. Your back doesn't move at all. So you need exercises which exercise the move and exercise the back. And that's going to be yoga and Pilates. Now, I know all of you are saying, ah, how am I going to do this? Who says you're not going to do this? This one, I can't get pictures which do not show you not doing this because everything on the internet, the pictures all look as if everybody's fit and healthy. But the whole idea of yoga is to start doing yoga because the exercise that you get from yoga will actually help your back. You may or may not be able to achieve this, but if you don't achieve it, it doesn't matter. The whole idea is if you can even get halfway up, it's good enough because you're actually doing something with it. Now, most people can do this, but it takes an effort. It's not going to be a quick fix solution. Even with surgery, it's not a quick fix solution. You still have to exercise your back in the long run. Oops. Okay, next one. Swimming, also very good. I mean, I'm sure some apartments and some swimming pools, you'll see this 70, 80 year old, they go up and down every morning, up and down and up and down. You're looking at them and say, wow, how, are this? how do they do this? That's because swimming is actually very good for your back. Swimming should be at least three kilometers per week. It sounds a lot, and it is. So you're talking about 20 lengths 
of an Olympic sized pool three times a week. And that is real swimming. The swimming and paddling you mess around with, it's okay. But if you really want to exercise your back, then it's proper swimming. And don't forget backstroke. Everybody does breaststroke, really, they do just front crawl. But you have to flip over and actually do backstroke because backstroke exercises the front. Because you have to keep your head out of the crown, otherwise you'll be drinking water all the time. So you have to do backstroke. Backstroke very important. So usually backstroke is much harder. That I agree. I also don't like backstroke. So the way around it is to do three lengths of either front crawl or breaststroke and do one backstroke. Compromise. One in four. But at least you do backstroke. Okay? Tai Chi, also very good. I know very I use you say 30 years old, you want me to do Tai Chi? Ah, you don't have to do Tai Chi. These are the alternatives. You can go and do swimming, you can do yoga, you can do pilates. But Tai Chi is also a very good exercise for your legs, for your brain, because you have to remember all the moves, and also for your back, because it actually moves your back most of the most and the range of motion that Tai Chi does is actually excellent. Now, a long-term fix is this target, so-called targeted exercise of your core muscles. So this you're looking at the back here. These are the muscles in the from the looking from the back. And this erector spinae and all the lumbar lumborum muscles and also the uh, iliopsoas here are actually extremely important around the core. And if you take a cross section of the spine, which is here, this is the back here. So this is the front, and you're looking at the back. So this is the abdomen in front. This is the this is the back. So this is the bone, and you take a cross section. There's a whole leash of muscles that control the back. These are the muscles that are really, really important. And these are so-called core muscles. And if you do yoga, pilates, swimming, tai chi, these muscles here, including the front, will actually improve. And that's what is going to control your back pain in the long run. So core exercises, extremely important. You can use dumbbells. You can do it on the ground in the park. You can help the people doing this. And this is also all part of core exercises. I mean, this is a very sh shortened version of what you should be done, but it's to give you an idea that you can actually treat your back without surgery and also get your back pain down without surgery. All right, we are open for questions. Now, we've had some questions before that have come in on, on a preemptive basis. So if there are no questions on the net, we will go through some of this. Now, some ways of preventing lower back pain. Again, long term wise, if you're at home, you have back pain, then the thing to do is to exercise. Core exercises, the most important. Tai Chi, yoga, swimming. I know other people are asking, me, I just can do those sort of exercise. The answer is you want to play football, you can play football. But you have to get your back strong enough to go and play football. You cannot just go and play football and expect your back to work. Because if your back is already weak, if you, do, if you go and play football, you're going to injure your back even more. Because to kick the ball, don't forget you have to tense the muscles in your back and your leg to kick the ball. And if your back is not strong enough, when you kick the ball, the rebound from the ball, hitting the ball, is going to injure yourself. And then you're going to get pain again. So you have to work the back. So prevention of back pain, unfortunately, is a long, once you have problems, it's a long-term problem. So once or twice a week, either yoga or pilates or swimming worth doing even once a week worth doing the warning is if you already have pain and you go start exercise for the first month you may actually have a bit more pain but don't don't worry about that because as you keep going the pain actually comes down so it might take you a month or two to get better but keep going slowly and increase your activity for your back so tai chi yoga pilates and uh tai and uh swimming these are the main four things that you should really be doing uh, the next question was, uh, okay, why, when should I go to the doctor for my back pain? This is quite simple. If you started exercising, you still have pain, come and see me. If you have pain going down the leg that's disturbing you, you find it hard to walk or to sit down, come and see the doctor, go and see the doctor. If you have severe weakness in the leg, also better go and see the doctor. So these are the main signs that you actually have to see somebody if you're actually in pain because if it's not settling down with just simple medication and exercise, then you may need injections or you may need uh, other medication uh, to treat the back. 
Why is my pain vulnerable to pain and injury? It's a catch-22, you see, because once you have muscles are weak, then it's easier to injure the back. If you don't work the muscles, once the muscles remain weak. Uh, rest is a funny thing. Rest, when you have pain, you rest, but the muscles don't move. When the muscles don't move, then it doesn't, it doesn't activate, it doesn't exercise, it doesn't strengthen. So sitting in the bed or lying down in the bed for two weeks to rest your back will get your pain better, but it doesn't prevent you from getting further injuries because your muscles have not worked in the last two weeks. And there's also evidence to show now if you do that and you lie down in bed for two weeks after a back injury, it's too long. You actually have to get the pain down and start physiotherapy straight away. Because if you lie down in bed, your muscles weaken even further and the chances of you having another uh, back injury uh, soon is actually very high. Permanent disability. What are the chances that my back pain will result in permanent disability without treatment? Answer is very low. Uh, I know I, I know you probably heard the patient or you know have this back pain and then they become paralyzed. And that's very rare. You see, it's very easy to, to, to explain this. Uh, it's like when I, my, my, my patients tell me that they, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to have to have things done to their back, let's say for their knee. When you go to the market and you walk around with the limp and the back around and the back pain, everybody will notice. They'll say, Oh, auntie, auntie, uncle, how is you tia? Tia, because why you tia? Now, iya bobo. See, you only notice that. But if the patient has had treatment already and they walk past you, they walk past the, the, the hawker or walk past anybody, you won't notice because you won't, you won't know that he's had treatment and you won't ask him, are you better or you're not better? Because he just goes past normally. So bad news unfortunately gets noticed. And so you will, you will hear more bad news than you will hear more good news. Because patients who have had problems with the back, who end up paralyzed or who end up uh, uh, not doing well, you will know. But patients who have had surgery or have had physiotherapy treatment or have had uh, injections who do well, they will just walk normally and you will not know that they've had anything wrong. And that's the reason. Now, we also have a, uh, uh, what do you call, a question from Annabelle and Ambalagi Nala. For preventive purposes, can one start taking calcium tablets with vitamin D before age 30 and continue as maintenance along with exercises and food? Uh, okay, we split this up. Calcium tablets, unless you are calcium deficient, does absolutely zero, okay? Absolutely zero for back pain. Calcium as a supplement, you can take calcium as a supplement, but don't expect calcium to prevent back problems or bone problems because there's no medical evidence to show that calcium prevents bone problems unless you are already calcium deficient. So calcium as a supplement, don't waste your money. If you really want to take anything for your muscles, then it's worth taking a small dose of magnesium, 50 to 100 milligrams. That relaxes the muscles and that one I think is worth taking. But calcium, no. Vitamin D is the same thing. Uh, you should check your vitamin D levels. Uh, the answer is yes, vitamin D is worth taking because vitamin, although we say we are in a sunny country and we have, there's a lot of sun here and so we should not be vitamin D deficient. The reverse is true. How many of you go out in the sun and rain sun yourself every day? You're supposed to have two hours in the sun, no? direct sunlight. Sitting by the window does not count. Through the glass door or through the glass window does not count. I repeat that. Repeat that. Sitting through the getting sunlight by the window does not count. So unfortunately, a lot of our uh, uh, patients are actually vitamin D deficient because they are not getting enough sunlight. Yes, we do manufacture vitamin D in our own body, but you have to be in the sunlight. You have to be playing tennis or sitting out in the hot sun. Cannot allow our skin not nice, uh, get burned, uh, wear hair, uh, cover until you see the eyes and then you play tennis. Doesn't work. So vitamin D, check your vitamin D levels. If it's deficient, answer is pick. But above all, back exercise is very important. Okay, next one is uh, potential risks and benefits 
of other available treatments. Actually, for the back problem, we've covered most of it already. There, I mean, like I said, you can go and see uh, Sincere's and chiropractors and things. As long as they know what they're doing, it actually is okay because some of them are very good. Uh, like I said, I think I'm not allowed to say who, but really some of them are very good. And I will recommend uh, certain people which I know who have actually had good experience and tell them to go and see, go and, uh, go and do chiropractic treatment if they don't want to come for physio or whether it's an osteopath or whether it's a science instead. So risk is very low. Uh, if you have a sudden acute of pain, then it's worth getting an MRI and make sure that it's, that it's, uh, there's a slip disc that's causing the problem. Another question from uh, Annabelle, basically is magnesium along with zinc is okay. Answer is uh, magnesium, zinc, zinc is nowhere here, nowhere there. Uh, if you are young, basically all you need is actually a muscle relaxer so that your muscles don't tighten up too much. Uh, so I will usually just recommend magnesium without any other supplements because if you want to go into the realm of supplements, there is so any supplements, this is supposed to be good for you, that's supposed to be good for you. Depends on which newspaper you want to read this morning. Tomorrow it'll be another journal, tomorrow it'll be another health magazine and tell you this is good. And what you end up doing, you buy multivital. But if you're talking specifically about anything, then I think magnesium is worth taking. Uh, because then otherwise you get in the realm of selenium, uh, whether it causes uh, muscle relaxation. There's so many. So magnesium, uh, magnesium I think it's worth taking the rest. Uh, you can try, it doesn't matter, if, you're, if you want to have some, it's okay. But magnesium, I think, is the, about the only thing that will be worth taking for muscle relaxation, relaxation in terms of your back. Because we are talking about the back today. Now, if you want to talk about other things, then, with, then calcium and magnesium, zinc and all that, that's a different ballgame altogether. Uh, another question from here was, uh, what are the symptoms of back pain that I shouldn't ignore? I think if you have persistent pain, like I said just now, you have persistent pain that's not responsive to treatment. If you have pain for more than one or two days, three days, you should come and see a doctor. If you have pain going down the leg, then yes, also you should go and see a doctor. Uh, if you have recurrent pain and it keeps coming and going, yes, you probably will. You shouldn't ignore those as well. All right. If my butt hurts, should I limit my mobility? The answer is yes, because if you don't limit your mobility at that point in time, uh, you will then have more pain. So it's good to rest, maybe a day or two. Uh, if, then it should get better, but don't put yourself into bed for two weeks because that is really overall treatment. Don't try that. Because your muscles will then shrink. Your muscles become very weak. You may feel better, but by the time you get out, you'll be so wobbly. Don't do that. So if your back is really painful, Medication, see a physiotherapist or a chiropractor, wait one or two days. If it's still not better, then you better get yourself to see a doctor because then you may need an MRI scan. Another question coming up. Uh, what's the role of exercise and activity modifications in patients with back pain? Actually, I have a very different principle from people, most people in the sense that if you have back problem, my idea is like this. I treat a lot of athletes for knee injuries and back injuries and also uh, ankle injuries. If you want to play football, then you treat your back and your knee so you can play football. Otherwise, the choice is you don't play football. So which one do you want? So it's the same thing with the back. You tell me you have a back problem, so I should not be doing this, I should not be doing this, I should not be sitting down too long, I should be standing, I should, be, I should not be doing this. If you want to find a thousand and one, I should not do this. I will give you a list, but the list, you can go out, you can do it, it's up to you. My attitude is like this, you treat your back, treat your back still so it's well enough, then you go back playing football, then you don't have to worry about the chair, you don't have to worry about the table, you don't have to worry about your computer, you don't have to worry about your fan, you don't have to worry whether the bed is too soft, you don't have to worry whether your pillow is wrong. Because if you can get well enough, like you did, before you had your back problem. Why not? Do you want that? Or do you want a whole list of you should not do this, you should not do this, you should not do this, you should not do this? Up to you. So you have to decide yourself which sort of treatment you want. My attitude is you treat until you can go back to football. Okay, maybe not football. Uh, football is very strenuous. Uh, but you go back so that you don't have to worry whether your chair is good enough. Because 
Your chair, don't forget, these are standard chairs. So they're supposed to be for a general population. Yes, I have written letters for some patients who have chronic problems which need modification of their work. But if you can treat them well enough that 90% or 95% of them don't need that modification, why not? Which means that you are as good as, they, as you can get without having to have modified anything else. It is possible. But I can give you the advice. You are going to have to do the work because the work is going to be the exercise. If you're not willing to exercise, you'll always have chronic back pain. It doesn't matter. I, like I said to you, don't forget, I have chronic back pain. I've had it for the last, I'm now 60, I've had it for the last 40 over years. But I exercise my back. It is possible to, 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 to keep going. Next question. Uh, there are factors such as age or lifestyle choices that increase someone's risk for lower back pain. Answer is yes. Once you, once, if you play a lot of sports which entail falling down, which is like football, basketball, all the contact sports, obviously you're more at risk of getting a slip disc. If you age prematurely or you age at 30 plus, 40 plus, remember I said to you, 100% of patients will actually, 100% of people will get back pain at some stage of their life, whether it's 30 plus, 40 plus, 50 plus, you will get back pain. But it's not all doom and gloom, no. You can still continue. You can still go and do hiking, you can still go and enjoy yourself. The whole idea is to try and maintain the back end. That's where the exercise and the maintenance comes in. And one more question. Doesn't make sense to me to treat my back pain with exercise instead of rest. Ah, yes, explain. You see, remember I said to you, if you rest your muscles, your muscles weaken. Okay, you get less pain, but then your muscles weaken. So if you don't exercise your muscles, the muscles then cannot control the back. Remember I was talking about core muscles? If you don't work the core muscles, it doesn't control the back. If it doesn't control the back, you're going to get pain again. So core muscles, if you Google core muscles and exercise for core muscles, that's the best because there are so many uh, what do you call uh, videos on YouTube you can Google now. You just go to the Google, uh, Google videos, YouTube, Google core muscles, Pilates, and yoga. And all of them are sections of either 15, 20 minutes. Ignore the buy this, buy that at the beginning. All of them have you make you want to buy this stuff like that stuff. Forget about that one. So just look at the mus look at the, the, the exercise where you yeah, some of them look very difficult. You go and do all sorts of funny things, but don't don't expect to be able to do that at the beginning. You are. But the whole idea is that you have to start. If you don't start, your muscles will never get strong. So exercise for the back is extremely important. So if there are no more questions, we will then end this session. I hope that you had a good outing, and we will then try and get you oh, okay back on track. Okay.